Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of the Black Health Trust. We've been around for a few years talking about not only COVID-19, but health disparities, as well as giving what we believe is well-vetted health advice. So we have a number of us who just came back from the convention of the National Medical Association in New Orleans. In honor of her Darcy, I had some of the best gumbo that you've ever had. I even had it at the Four Seasons, which was a treat. The other comment I want to make, I wore around this cap that I have on. It says the USS Missouri. I put that on in honor of Dr. Richard Williams. But people kept telling me, thank you for your service. But if my memory serves me right, one, I know I didn't serve. But this hat, in order to really justify me wearing this hat, I have to be about 120 years old if I had served, which I am not quite that old, Richard Williams. <laughs> uh, we have a very special guest uh, speaking today, uh, as well as myself. And we're going to ask her to go, for, go first. Her name is Dr. C. Suzanne Cutter. She hails from the great city of Cincinnati, Ohio. And I always remark we had two tracks of schooling there. There were the hoodlum schools, which I went to, and then there was a the smart school that she went to called Warren Hills. She is a graduate of medical school at, at Rush in Chicago. She did a surgical fellowship in the New York Health and Hospital System. She did a research fellowship at Sloan Kettering. She did a fellowship in uh, surgical Oncology at Cedar sinai and she is currently in private practice in Los Angeles, California, at a number of our local hospitals, and she is also the president of the NMA affiliate, the Charles R. Drew Medical uh, Society, and our topic today is there is more to obesity than just pounds or weight that affects your life and your health. I'm going to ask Dr. Suzanne Cutter to be the first presenter. And when she finishes, I'll back clean up and we'll uh, have a few questions. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Richard Williams if he would serve as a co-moderator to ask, answer, ask questions. And also if Dr. Jesse Sherrod would assist him in that, since our other co-hosts are out on cruises, on their way to Sweden, et cetera. Dr. Suzanne Cutter, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Maxey. I appreciate that. Um, what I prepared today is really some topics based on our last discussion. If you remember, we did a nice discussion on metabolic surgery and people had some questions about some particular items. So I wanted to double back, talk about those items and then talk about some solutions. But I'm titling this Getting Real With Yourself because this is really a personal journey uh, this is not so much about your doctor or what society is saying about your weight is something that's kind of individually uh, focused on. And so it's important that you are real and honest with yourself. So I have no disclosures, but I'm open to opportunities, uh, consulting products, what have you, let me know. So let's start off with the big, you know, elephant in the room, as it were, which is BMI. You know, we do a lot of talking about BMI. And uh, last time, Dr. Maxey brought up, you know, this importance of the variations in ethnicity, and we weren't really prepared to talk about it at this time, but I thought I would try to do that today. If you notice, the orange is the beginning of obesity. That's between that yellow and red figure, but look how normal that person looks. So, you know, our views on what sizes we should be um, may be skewed in one direction or another. And is this really obese? in terms of cosmetics or is it in beast in terms of physiology? You know, that's really what this topic is about. So what is obesity and what is BMI in particular? BMI is body mass index. And it's really a simple calculation. You take the weight in kilograms. So yes, we're in metrics here and you divide it by the height in meters squared and that gives you the BMI. So if you look at how we use that number, underweight is less than or equal to 18.5. And then we go to obesity, which is 30 and above. So it's that gray area in between that we do a lot of talking about in terms of uh, making some changes and some choices. 
Now there's some advantages to using this simple calculation. I mean, it's easy to calculate. It doesn't require any special equipment. You know, to really accurately measure fat, you need to have calipers or there's some other systems where you immerse people in fluids and liquids. And there's some other devices that check gases and things like that. So we don't really have that in every office. So BMI is convenient. I and mean, you can use it anywhere as long as you have the internet. But some disadvantages are that it doesn't really take into account muscle mass. It can't distinguish between bad fat and good fat. And yes, there is some good fat, in particular brown fat, which we see in high levels in babies. And then it doesn't account for ethnic variations in obesity. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But let's look at a couple of examples. A weightlifter may be considered obese. Why? Muscle is very heavy. And so their weight, according to their meter squared, is quite out of proportion. And then you could take somebody who has really high belly fat. So you've ever seen that person from behind, they look very narrow and skinny, and then they turn around and there's a little bit extra that you weren't expecting. That person, because adipose tissue or fat tissue is lighter, they may be considered a normal BMI, but they have a lot of that bad fat, if you will. Now let's jump over into the ethnics of BMI because this is really what came up last time. So there was an article that was put out in the Mayo Clinic proceedings and someone wrote a letter and say, hey, I'm gonna oppose this whole thing of BMI and I'm going to use some data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. survey. And you can look at some of this data on the NIH websites. But they said, I'm gonna take a look at weight status, race, ethnicity, gender, and then risk for obesity related diseases like diabetes, hypertension, blood pressure, hypercholesterol. And then they said, I'm gonna really kind of break this down in terms of ethnicity and show some of the differences that we see in terms of risk of some of those diseases and also some of the other characteristics. So the first line shows black women and that BMI is 30 to 31. And that's really fits in with the scale that we saw earlier. Hispanic women are a little bit lower at 29. Black and Hispanic men at 28 and Asian women way down at 25. So at 25 BMI, an Asian woman is considered obese, not because of the external appearance, but because of the internal appearance. And if you wanna know what that means in terms of you know, a regular person, so somebody who's about 5'5", five, five, and I think that's around average for a woman, and 180 pounds, if you're black, that's okay. If you're Hispanic, you need to weigh about 175. And if you're Asian, you need to weigh about 150 or less. Okay, so those are some of the ethnic variations. Dr. Maxi, does that kind of answer some of the, you know, the issues that you had with BMI last time? Are we getting to the tip of the iceberg? It does. Okay, so that's that's some of those variations, and it accounts for the, you know, weightlifters and all of those things. Now. Another topic came up last time that people seem to be a little bit excited about, which is the microbiome. And as I said, this is one of my favorite topics. So let's dig into this. Now, I included a couple of articles and, you know, a little bit of detail, but not so much to overwhelm. But this is just enough for you to kind of get a little bit of interest and you go out and do your own research. Um, but this particular uh, Genes and Nutrition Journal published this article on obesity and the microbiota. And so it starts off with a nice little definition, and it's basically a community of organisms that reside in the GI tract. Think about your whole GI tract. It starts with your mouth, esophagus, stomach, it goes on into the intestines and everything, but each portion has a different population of these organisms. And so that's what makes up your particular microbiota. And does anybody know what the dirtiest place in the body is? Well, it's usually considered the mouth. So, you know, think about all the places where it comes and goes and think about babies. Babies explore the world with their mouths. That's their first introduction, not their first, but that's an early introduction to a lot of organisms. But let's look at the gut or the GI tract. So it's considered an organ, this microbiome there. And it regulates a lot of physiology, a lot of functions, you know, how the the intestines and stomach moves and if it absorbs nutrients appropriately and fat distribution. One thing that I found particularly gratifying is guess what? It's rapidly modified by dietary changes. What does that mean? You can do something about it. You're not a victim of your microbiome. So I think that's an important point. And so where does it come from? Well, you know, babies are sterile at birth in terms of their microbiome, but they're colonized during delivery. 
and it's enhanced by breastfeeding. So if you have a lean microbiome mother, then as they're delivered, they pick up that lean microbiome. If you have an obese microbiome mother, they pick up that obese microbiome. So some people say, oh, obesity is hereditary. hereditary. Well, there may be some hereditary diseases, but we're picking up these things as we are born and as we breastfeed. And so we really can get some of these characteristics from parents. So really after birth, that's an opportunity to kind of change that microbiome around. It's an opportunity. It regulates energy and metabolism, fat storage. It's important for the immune function. And you know, as a cancer surgeon, that's really important to me and also to the barrier function. And there's, it's a driving force in uh, metabolic uh, issues and terms that are associated with obesity. So let's look at what we call dysbiosis. That means when that nice even balance or homeostasis is disrupted, just like disruption, we call it dysbiosis. And so that's associated with diseases of the GI tract, neurologic disease, Respiratory diseases, metabolic, cardiovascular illnesses, all of these things are impacted by dysbiosis of the microbiome. And some people have even said that when they go to a specialist and they kind of withdraw a lot of foods, they go to a very pure diet, that they start to see some changes, some improvements in some of their illnesses. So I just submit to you that there's a lot that you can do to impact your body and your health if you make some dietary modifications with prebiotics and probiotics and things like that. And then finally, obesity is correlated with this imbalance. This is for the technical uh, nerds out of all of us, which includes me. Um, this uh, firmicutes and bacteriodetes uh, balance, when this is imbalanced, that's associated with obesity. My goodness, how would you know what has those items in there? Well, again, that's something that you're going to have to look up and study and figure out how you can get that back in balance. But I thought that was interesting. This is a figure from that same paper. And the reason why I'm showing it is the following. Take a look at the diet, you know, associated with the lean individual. And they kind of put the whole Neanderthal man up here with the wild plants and the raw meats and everything. And what that did for that person is they had a very high carbohydrate intake, 55 to 60%. Your first thought is like, oh my goodness, more bread, you know, more potatoes. This is awesome. But think about these carbohydrates. These are not simple carbohydrates that are in those processed foods. These are the complex carbohydrates in a plant-based diet. So these are high plant-based diets. Um, consumers and also very low fat, less than 30%. But our regular Western diet, you can see over here on the right, we've got this high um, carbohydrate intake of 51.8%. These are not the good carbs. These are the simple carbs, the ones that put um, the fat and, and other items into the body and the bloodstream and the high fat percentage. What I also think is interesting is there's just a teeny tiny little difference between the you know, the healthy amount of fat, less than 30%, and then 32.8%. So these small changes are probably just enough to help you to get out of this obesity mode if that's what you desire. All right, the next paper on microbiome, and this is gonna be quick. Um, and this is the interaction with different food components. And then I'm just showing this to show the different diets that are focused on in this particular one. They hear, they talk about the amines, polyamines, and something called methylphenols. And then on the, you know, the health promoting side, they talk about the polyphenols. I really invite you to look up um, polyphenols and what foods we can find them in. Some of the top items are things like berries and of all things, cocoa. We add sugar to it that makes cocoa bad. <laughs> Spices, nuts, seeds, red wine, um, things like that, olives. So that goes in with what is called the Mediterranean diet. Like I said last time, this is my favorite diet because it's a, a low deprivation diet. You can eat all the fruits and vegetables that you want, a little bit of meat, a little bit of cheese, a little bit of sweets. You can have a little bit of everything. You don't have to deprive yourself completely. And you can see over here, the Western diet is just filled with you know, additives and things like this. This is a burrito, a burger, and roast chicken from the grocery store. I know you guys eat that, so be on the lookout for it. Okay, 
So now we're at the stage of solutions and I just have a few slides on this. Let's look at obesity medicine. Last time we looked at obesity surgery, now we're gonna jump into medicine. But there's basically four pillars of obesity medicine, nutrition, therapy, physical activity, behavioral modification, and pharmacotherapy. So let's unpack that a little bit. Nutrition therapy. So one of the most important things that we need to avoid, in my opinion, are these sugar and sweetened beverages, because we all know about the dangers of high fat foods and things like that. But people don't really think about those sweetened beverages, pop, soda, you know, depending on what part of the country you come from, energy drinks, you know, things like that. The sugar contact content is staggering. And for those of you in the South, I know we have somebody on here from Mississippi, sweet tea, that's another culprit. So we have to do that one in mod mod moderation too. So what can you do? Increase your intakes of fruits, vegetables, four to five servings every day. Fiber, so important. I'm not talking about added fiber. I'm talking about food selections that are high in fiber. And then protein. I think protein is one of the most beneficial things for individuals over the age of 60 to 65. It's that decrease in protein that causes us to have a lack of muscle mass, which decreases our metabolism. And that combined with more sedentary behaviors that we see in older people, that's what really kind of helps to deteriorate health. But if you could keep your protein levels up and keep your muscle mass up, you would be surprised at how youth giving that combination is. And of course, drinking enough water to wash everything out. Um, it's at this point that I wanna say, it's important when you get finished doing your business in the bathroom to take a look down below into that toilet bowl and see what things are looking like. I'm not gonna get too specific, but one component should be brown, soft, but formed, and the other one should be relatively clear yellow. If that's not happening, let's make some changes. Here's some common diets. You know, all of these have been shown to have some type of benefits, some more than others, and some longer lasting than others. So you have to pick something that works for you. Again, I always talk about the Mediterranean diet because it, to me, it's kind of a low deprivation diet. But the obesity medicine group says that it's the best diet is one that you can stick to and that will help you to lose weight if that's what you need to do. And that improves your overall health, which is what we all need to do. So that's the dietary component. Now let's look at physical activity. You know, you gotta set goals for yourself and the time to set those goals is today. So you don't say, well, I'm gonna start working out tomorrow. I feel inspired. As soon as we get off the Zoom, get up, do something for 10 minutes. You wanna prevent injury by avoiding these high intensity workouts if you haven't worked out in 20 years. So I know you played football in college, but you're not in the same condition. You don't wanna have injuries because that's gonna make things worse. So just take it a little easy. So you wanna work on frequency. That means working out five days a week is optimal. And then duration. So you can do 15 minutes of something five days a week. And then as time goes on, add five minutes to each, each episode. You wanna get to a minimum of 150 minutes per week. And the more that you can maximize that, the better. A lot of women do a lot of cardio and cardio is good, but it needs to be combined with strength and resistance training. So a nice combination will help you to build those lean muscles. Lean muscle increases metabolism. And that's why so many men who are muscular really don't have a lot of trouble keeping their weight off. It's that muscle that really helps. So here are some examples. These are not surprises to anybody. One thing that I really like for people over 60 and 65 is Pilates. It takes the, uh, it takes a gravity out of the picture. You can lay on the floor. If you can't get down on the floor and get up, lay at the foot of your bed. That's an area of the bed that really is pretty firm. And so you can kind of use that as your flora floor, but it gives you a good surface to work out on. Pilates, not with a reformer, but I mean Pilates mat is really helpful. And there are some other things that help you to keep fit and active, but keep in mind, like cleaning the house You'd have to clean the house for like three hours every day to really, you know, to really be equivalent to karate or something like that. So just cleaning the house for 15 minutes isn't going to do it. And here's some um, images of some great activities. You have the resistance bands in the middle and some stretching exercises. This reminds me of Pilates as well as yoga. So those are some other things you can do if you don't want to bike or take the stairs or swim or something like that. And then the final pillar of obesity medicine is behavioral modification. It takes about three months to change your behavior, but if you stay focused on your goal, you stay positive and you surround yourself 
with people who have healthy habits, it can really help. Sometimes you have to be that person with the healthy habits and surround other people. That's okay too. But you want to foster a good relationship with food that's not based on reward or on emotion. So you, food should be seen as fuel, not so much in terms of your enjoyment. Of course, how many times do we all go out to dinner and happy hour and things like that with friends? But it's better to get into that mode. And you want to feel your physical hunger. And it takes about 20 minutes for that to register when you begin eating. So take your time with your meal. That's why they say you should eat over the course of about 30 minutes because you can overeat if you're just gobbling down food. And you know the other thing is you wanna take small bites, you wanna chew a lot, and you just wanna take your time. Hard for us to do you know, when we have busy careers, but it, it is worthwhile in the long run. There's some old habits to get rid of. A lot of people skip breakfast, they swear by it but it does do a number on your metabolism. So you wanna make sure that you're balancing things out. You also wanna avoid uh, eating dinner quickly and overeating. That's when people do a lot of socializing and things that you do in the middle of the night or in front of the TV. So what can you do? You wanna plan your meals and read food labels. That's so important. Get to know how much fat and additives are in different things so that you know what you're eating and measure your portion sizes. Do you want a plate this big? No, you really want that kind of salad plate and half of it should be the vegetables and the other half um, you divide between the protein and whole grains. And if you practice that, you will find that it's easier and easier to shed the weight that you don't want. And sleep is a big part of this. People don't really always associate sleep with weight management, but restorative or quality sleep at night is critical. It's recommended that you at least get six hours and you don't want to get much more than nine hours. If you get less than six hours, it's about five or less, then that's associated with higher mortality as is over nine hours of sleep a night. Higher mortality with both of those extremes. So we always want to kind of stay in that middle positive zone with pretty much everything we do. And then if you have trouble falling asleep, there's a lot of sleep hygiene things that you can do. You want to, you know, stop with the electronics two hours before going to sleep. That's hard for a lot of people to do. And then avoid those bright lights. And the other thing is morning sunlight. That really helps to waken you up and invigorate you. If you sleep with those blacked out curtains, there are alarm clocks that will have a projection that appears to be sun that will help to wake you up in the morning. I'm fascinated by this. So if somebody gets it, let me know how that works. And then there's also pharmacotherapy. So this is an adjunct really to the other three. Medication is not meant to help you to lose weight per se. It is something that you add on to good habits. So the focus of everything is lifestyle change, not medications or surgery. So you wanna start off with those areas, but if you have these other um, risk factors in particular diabetes type two, then some of these medications and things can be added on to help you. So here's some examples of medications um, that we hear about sometimes on television. Um, and if you can see, a lot of these have uh, a diabetes version. Some of these are really focused on for diabetes. One thing I think is interesting is it shows you just the amount of weight loss you're gonna have. It's really just five to 15% can really make a difference. 15% weight loss can help you to get rid of a lot of comorbidities, just 15%. So if you can do a lifestyle change and get you to the 10% and take a medication for a short time to get you to the 15%, you'll see some differences and you may be able to stop taking certain medications. But keep an eye on this middle um, medication, uh, Kismia. Um, let's take a look at that one and keep that in mind. So here is where these medications work, the brain, the GI tract, uh, as well as in adipose tissue. So this diagram really shows um, where these medications work one by one. And the one that I told you to keep an eye on is the one with the black uh, horizontal symbol at the bottom, but that one works in the adipose tissue, in the stomach, in the pancreas, as well as in the brain. So all over the place. And that explains why it's awfully effective. But, you know, just like I said, with uh, surgery, there's no free lunch. And so you do have some side effects, in particular, that drug can elevate the heart rate, it gives you mood and sleep disorders, cognitive impairment, um, paresthesias, dry mouth, and so you have to avoid it if you have glaucoma, hypothyroidism, 
and some other ailments. Am I saying that everybody's gonna experience this? Absolutely not. But it's just good to keep in mind that there are some upsides and downsides, but these medications really can help you in the long run. So just in summary of the things that I highlighted during this talk, you know, getting real at this point is really getting really healthy for yourself. So I favor the Mediterranean style diet, but anything that emphasizes plant-based nutrition along with moderation in meat, fats, and sugar is a good thing. Read your food lab labels, get to know the protein content, the sodium content, and the fat content of the foods that you're eating. Drink your body weight in kilograms of water every day, at least that amount, and probably about five to 10% more to help keep what you're looking at in the toilet bowl looking and um, looking the way that it should be looking. You wanna combine cardiovascular and strength training together and make sure you get some restorative sleep. So uh, once Dr. Massey gets finished with his talk, he's gonna to talk to you about some more of the comorbidities, then I am available to answer questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Cutter, thank you so much. This was an excellent talk. Uh, you sound like an internal medicine specialist who happens to cut. <laughs> well, that is the, the dichotomy between you know, surgery and obesity medicine. It allows me to bridge the gap. <laughs> what I'd like to do, because I do want to give a few slides, which are mainly supportive of what you did, is ask my, uh, Dr. Walsh isn't on yet, is he? I'm going to ask Dr. Williams and Dr. Sherrod to, or one person in the audience to pose a question uh, on what Dr. Cutter presented. And then I don't want to be exhaustive, but then I want to give a few slides and we'll end up. Dr. Williams, any thoughts? Yes, sir. First thing, Dr. Cutter, that was an excellent, very comprehensive uh, exposure to, for all of us to uh, the uh, science of, of obesity medicine in particular. So thank you for that. Uh, one of the things that we always recognize on this show is that we have a large component of lay people on, uh, not necessarily physicians, and the lay people sometimes get confused by all these statistics that we give and <clears throat> that sort of thing. So get, getting back to BMI, uh, about which you gave a, a very good description. There are many people who don't understand that. And um, I wondered if uh, you could suggest a maybe alternative uh, mechanism or view of something that lay people can understand more. What I'm suggesting is, for instance, um, many times when I'm talking to to patients about uh, obesity, I refer not to BMI, but to waist size, waist circumference. And I wondered if you might have anything to say about that. I used to tell them that if a certain waist size was exceeded in, uh, for instance, Black women, that they had a five-year chance of mortality from cardiovascular disease and that's that sort of thing. So could you say anything about waist size or waist circumference that might be important to our lay audience? Excellent question. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Williams. You always have these insightful questions and great tips that we could use in the clinic and working with patients. So I have to tell you first that I do kind of torture my patients with terminology because I like for them to be somewhat conversant with the media and with other physicians and things like that. So I'll tell them, you know, a term and then I'll try to define it for them and then invite them to read about it to educate themselves. And so, you know, if we can brush up on some of the language, I think people also uh, have reduced healthcare disparities if they're a little bit more conversant with some of this terminology. But you hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, not necessarily an alternative, but an adjunct. And that adjunct is waist circumference. So that's part of the whole evaluation. Um, when you're getting an obesity medicine evaluation, that's one of the things that's measured. And, you know, waist circumference really is a pretty good proxy in terms of, um, you know, obesity and uh, health benefits. Although some people do pack on a lot of weight in the chest area, you know, which has the highest 
you know, cardiovascular risk. And so we can start talking about pear-shaped bodies and apple-shaped bodies and things like that. Some people pack on the weight down at the thigh. So if you really want to be, you know, someone who is kind of, you know, uh, comprehensive about that, some people recommend, you know, measuring the waist, you know, the chest girth, and also the thighs and the upper arms and kind of tracking that. And you know how it is with labs, you know, sometimes one value isn't really enough to tell you what you need to know, but if you can trend something, it gives you an idea as to what's happening. So thank you for that question. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams and Dr. Cutter. Dr. Sherrod, do you have a thought or a question? Is Dr. Sherrod unmuted? Simon, is Dr. Sherrod able to be unmuted? Okay. Good afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cutter, again. You know, I, I love hearing your lecture, and you did an excellent job today. I also agree with uh, Dr. William and his comments on uh, breaking it down so that the lay people can understand. My major concern is the epidemic of um, obesity in the pediatric population. And I'm just wondering if there is something that we, some plan we can come up with to kind of get the education, which I think is key, into the school system curriculum on um, food and nutrition and the correct information out there on food and nutrition through the schools. And I think we need to start there, but also with the mothers when they're even pregnant and um, their dietary uh, habits. Um, it's really very disconcerting and I'm very concerned about the amount of obesity that exists down in the population, the prevalence. The prevalence has definitely gone up. I look back at my picture in 1965 when I was like 10th grade and we were in a summer science program. There's a picture of about 50 of us Nobody on that picture, this is in 1965, nobody was obese. I mean, nobody was even overweight. So there's been a change in the food preparation. I think the American standard American diet has changed so dramatically that some of the things you mentioned is that you got to read every label. We've gotten away from more natural food into what I call chemicalized food. So we're drowning in food, but starving for nutrients in America. That's the standard American diet, which I, which stands for sad for me, which what is, is very question? sad. That's right. What's your question? Uh, my question, is, well, there are two questions that I wanted to bring up that are in the chat. I've been monitoring the chat, Dr. Maxi, for you. One is, are there any advantages to brown fat compared to other fat? That's from Dr. Gibson. And then the other terminology, which I think Dr. Uh, Cutter should uh, address is dysbiosis. And what does that mean? And his question was, is that the same as, or how does it relate to leaky gut, the dysbiosis? Okay, so you covered a lot of ground and it was all fantastic. I, you know, <laughs> I agree with you about the, you know, pediatric and adolescent population. And we like to just blame food, but, you know, there's two components, just like mom makes food and things like that. Dad can do the exercise, right? So both parents can play a role and good habits for the kids. And you're right about uh, preparing fresh food at home, uh, cooking at home and not using these convenience foods. It's a big deal. And like I said, you know, some of these traits are picked up, you know, the microbiome is kind of determined during the birth canal and then also with breastfeeding, but that can be reversed with a certain amount of diet and nutrition. So lifestyle can outweigh that. And unfortunately, obese children become obese adults they are five times more likely to remain obese throughout their lifetime. It's very difficult to recover from that. So intervening early is important. And the final thing I'll say on that particular topic is, you know, the school has a lot of work to do because they're trying to educate these kids. But in addition, they're trying to deal with food. And it's, it's I sometimes I think the school just has too many things to accomplish. So I think a lot of this should be done at home or during, you know, health and fitness activities in school. And, um, you know, putting responsibility on the parents and when children are of a certain age, putting some responsibility on them. You asked about good uh, brown fat. 
it's really a higher metabolic fat. It burns calories more effectively and efficiently than the regular fat. And that's seen in higher concentrations in babies. And then I think the last one, you were talking about dysbiosis. And that's really just describing the lack of balance between the kind of the bacteria that is for the lean individual and the bacteria that's for the obese individual. And once Dr. Maxi gets finished, I can throw up that slide again and we can kind of talk about which bacteria those are if people are that interested in the details, but it's really just losing the balance. And by the way, it's not like you can take a cup of the right, you know, you know, bacteria or what have you, you know, it comes from the foods that you eat and how they impact the way the microbiome reproduces itself. So that's the impact that we can have on that. Thank you so much for those thoughtful questions. Thank you, Dr. Cutter. I'm going to show a few slides. I'll probably go kind of fast. And Simon, can you let me uh, uh, show some slides? Okay. All right. Um, can you see my slides okay? Yes. So we know that more than 60% of the U.S. population is overweight or obese. There are some costs associated with uh, individuals who are obese. And these we know that it is $346 per year higher than normal weight person. And for people uh, who are normal weight over a year, it's more than $2,000. $845. Now, these are just some figures. I won't spend any time on the figures, but you can see for direct medical costs, there are more uh, per year than normal. There's a loss of wages. I don't have the figure for men. There's short-term disability, long-term disability, and pension differences, and sick leave and absenteeism. It happened to be, I'm going to say this in, in good harmony, uh, it's more for women than it is for men and the loss of productivity. We'll, Dr. Cutter and I will have a discussion about that later. Uh, we know that life insurance is more expensive, but it's about the same. But there's also a difference in lost weight, lost life uh, due to premature mortality that occurs. So there is a fat gene, the FTO gene, and it's among genes that have been identified uh, of the fat mass and obesity associated gene is on chromosome number 16 and has the strongest genetic association with obesity. For example, if the single nucleotide uh, particle variant in the first part of the FTO gene are noteworthy, they cause obesity risk alleles for their frequency. And 70% of people that are either heterozygous, meaning they have the two different genes of the same type, a homozygous, meaning they have two that are similar. These people are 1.7 times more likely to be obese than others. So there is a fat gene. However, there has been no correlation of it being more so in African-Americans than in whites. And I'm going to skip this, some of this stuff so Dr. Cutter covered all of it. Um, so... In terms of mortality, it's associated with being considered overweight. And we know that, that we've known that for more than 2,000 years, and I think it's actually in, in the Bible. But I want to talk about the two types of fat that we have. There's brown fat, as Dr. Cutter mentioned, and there's also white fat. Uh, so brown fat is composed of several small lipid fat droplets and a large number of iron-containing mitochondrial, mitochondria. The mitochondria, the cell's heat-burning engine, that's what heats us up. The iron 
along with lots of blood and tiny blood vessels, gives this fat its brownish appearance. Brown fat is usually found in the front and back of the neck and in the upper back. And as Dr. Cutter said, it's mainly uh, present as you're an infant. So the main purpose of brown fat is to burn calories in order to generate heat. So it's often referred to as good fat, whereas the white fat is the bad fat. So brown fat is derived from muscle tissue and is found primarily in hibernating animals and newborns. After infancy, the quantities of brown fat decrease. Adults who have comparatively more brown fat tend to be younger and slender and have normal blood uh, sugar levels. Uh, you generate brown fat by exercising regularly. That can prevent white and yellow fat uh, uh, to be less there. And we know that if you eat a good diet, high quality, and again, exercise, get sleep, as Dr. Cutter said, uh, that will increase your amount of brown fat. White fat is composed of single liquid lipid droplets and has far less mitochondrial uh, uh, in it and less blood vessels. That's why it looks yellow or white. So again, white fat provides the largest energy reserve in the body. It's a thermal insulator and a cushion. If you fall on your behind, it cushions you in your body but it also cushions your organs against damage. It's a major endocrine organ. It doesn't just sit there. It has 30 or 40 enzymes in it that are active at all times. So fat has uh, insulin, growth hormone, adrenaline, corticosteroids, a stress hormone. So it's a myth that these cells just sit there and do nothing. White fat is active as is brown fat. So white fat is found more in women and excess fat accumulates around the hips, the thighs, and the buttocks, and the breasts until perimenopausal or in your, their 40s. Uh, so it's very interesting what that white fat can do. But of more importance, I think, is what we call uh, visceral fat. And if fat is in your abdomen, if it's around your organs, uh, that is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. So location of fat uh, is really important of where it is. An excess of white fat throughout the body is associated with increased risk of breast cancer, colon cancer, esophageal, pancreatic cancer, et cetera. It's also associated with sleep apnea and physical disabilities such as knee arthritis because knees are weight-bearing joints. Uh, so I thought it was interesting what normal weight can do. So men's body fat is 15 to 25% and women's is 15 to 30%. Uh, your generic 155, 150 pound person would carry about 20 pounds of fat. So one pound of stored fat contains roughly 4,000 calories. So 20 pounds has 80,000 calories of energy stored. So if you were on some island in the South Pacific and there's one tree, uh, you require 2,000 calories to live per day. You could last about 40 days on a desert island. After that, you're in trouble. So <clears throat> consuming too many calories can lead to more white fat. Uh, and as a species, fat is very important to, be survive to our survival. And it's a matter of how much fat and where it is located. Uh, you want to be control your visceral fat, which means you don't want to eat as much. You want to keep your waist circumference to less than 35 inches if you're a woman and 40 inches if you're a man. And so we want your total body fat to also be reasonably low. So does white fat interact with brown fat? Yes, it does. We know that new research has shown that people, when people overeat, they not only increase their total amount of white fat, but this overconsumption results in their brown fat becoming dysfunctional and inactive. And that leads to uh, inability to burn calories. So your ability to lose weight gets worse. So we want to optimize your brown fat function. We want to manage your white fat load by doing precisely the same thing. Eat 
whole foods in very severe moderation, stay active, practice stress, resilience, and lead a mindful lifestyle. Doing this will help your mitochondria be humming like you want to keep burning fat, and your health will go up greatly. And I'm going to skip the rest of this presentation because Dr. Cutter did such a good job. Uh, I don't need to go to my slides. Unshare me, Simon. And why don't we uh, go back to our, our screen? Can you get my, rid of my slide for me, Simon? Can you hear me? Am I being heard? I'm. I hear you, Doctor Maxey. Okay. What can we do to get rid of my slides? I think he's working on it. And you know, while he's doing that, you know, your whole discussion of white fat and brown fat was spectacular. You know, not a lot of people really understand that. And the fact that there are some things that people can do to reverse it, I think, is so powerful about what you said. Very important. I wanted to ask a question to both Dr. Maxey and Dr. Dr. Cutter. This is Dr. Williams. Uh, a few years ago, there was the emergence of a clinical uh, syndrome or description called the cardiometabolic syndrome. And we talked a great deal about it. We don't talk so much about it now, but it gave us an opportunity to categorize people according to a clinical entity uh, which was treatable. Uh, do you have anything to say about that now in regards to this whole aspect of obesity and uh, overweight and uh, metabolic problems? And along the way, um, could you say anything about something that many lay people sometimes describe? And that is, well, I'm not just a plain old fat. I've got a glandular problem. There's, <laughs> there's something wrong with my glands that uh, make me heavy. Uh, could you say anything about that? Is there any way that we could explain to people that that's not an excuse for obesity and overweight? Go ahead, Dr. Cutter. Okay, I was gonna give you the, the first part uh, and then I was gonna take the glandular problem. So you wanna take the first part? Well, well metabolic uh, syndrome is something that's true. And even though I spoke briefly about a, an FTO or fat-associated gene, uh, it is not clear whether that gene is all-powerful. That is just a part of the what I call gamish of interacting with obesity, uh, with eating, uh, with glandular issues. Uh, and we know that there's also been recently described something called the endocannabinoid system, uh, which is cannabinoid, cannabis, as you may know, is, is pot. But that acts upon the hypothalamus and controls your eating. And all of these things work together. It's also been shown with this fat gene, it may affect your thermogenesis and affect the way that lipid cells uh, get larger. So there are medicines that are aimed at decreasing the change of those fat cells and what they do. And we know that the metabolism is affected by your thyroid gland as well as your hypothalamus. So some people can have hypothyroid disease that can affect your weight in some degree. But basically, it's calories in and calories out. Make no mistake about it. I would just like I would just like to make one point too about um, fat in general because fat in general represents inflammation. In the body, when you have too much fat, that means that you have a chronic low level inflammation going on. And we often talk about fat and how you acquire it. And most people think that eating fat results in fat, but it's really the starches are stored as fat, the carbohydrates, if you want to call it that. And I was my question to Dr. both of the doctors, uh, Dr. Maxie and Dr. Cutter, is. You know, there was a lot of controversy about the Atkins diet, which represented, I think, a decrease in carbohydrates or carbohydrate free for a while with just protein and vegetables. 
Uh, what are you what are your recommendations on that and how do you think about that? And then the other point I wanted to make is that, yes, there is a gene for fat. But remember, we have genes for a lot of different things, but they don't manifest. It's the environment that determines whether they manifest or not. And so our environment has changed dramatically to the point that we we have this epidemic of obesity. And I think we need to look at the changes that have occurred in the environment that's resulting in all of this excess uh, weight, which is uh, leading to early deaths in our populations. In fact, Dr. Surad, you made a, a very important comment on your previous talk when you talked about your pictures back in 1965 when you were 10 years old, is it? Tenth grade. Fifth grade, okay, good. Tenth grade, tenth grade, Max. <laughs> Our food content has remarkably changed since then. For the that's world. right, <laughs> and so so we know that all of this processed food, fast food, and things we've been eating has dramatically changed. So what was a good diet back in the day is not a good diet now, and I think that's a major part of it. And part of it is sugar, which does call cause an inflammatory response. So there's a lot of truth to what you say. Uh, but we know that this obesity epidemic is multifactorial. It's not just one thing that you can point to. Dr. Cutter? Yeah, I want to really jump on this whole uh, concept of inflammation because that's really something that is cornerstone in terms of cancer development and metastatic disease. And in prior talks I've done in the Black Health Trust, I think the last time I talked about this was three years ago, but I talked about the difference in the fat cells in a lean individual and the fat cells in an obese individual. And in the obese individual, the fat develops into this ring-like structure. And in the middle are all of these factors that really build inflammation. Lean individuals don't form these ring-like structures. Their fat is more interactive and has more of the properties that Dr. Maxey talked about in his talk. So there is a different microenvironment in obese individuals where the fat behaves in a pro-inflammatory nature. And what that does is it lends itself to things like poor management of insulin, you know, and uh, insulin resistance is a huge component of obesity and diabetes and things like that. And then it also predisposes to some other conditions. So I, I wanted to bring out that point. The other thing about the glandular problem, I agree with Dr. Maxey on that, you know, looking at things like the thyroid and hypothalamus and all of that, there are some obesity syndromes, some genetic syndromes, but they're quite rare. And so I think most people, you know, it's kind of a, a discussion of the chicken and the egg, you know, am I obese because I have a glandular issue or do I have a glandular issue because I'm obese? And, you know, there are ways to come down off of that obesity mountain, you know, if you so desire. And sometimes it's really not quite easy, but as I said, sometimes just a 15% weight reduction will change your physiology to the state where it will improve some of your medical conditions. So those are the points that I wanted to make at that juncture. Thank you so much. That's right, are any other comments or questions in the chat? Uh, I don't see any new questions in the chat. Okay. Uh... There's one point though I wanted to make out. There was a question concerning leaky gut. And leaky gut is really uh, inflammation in the gut to the point that the tight junctions between the cells are lost. And therefore you have your uh, food leaking into your system as opposed to going through the proper digestive uh, process. And, you know, uh, Dr. Shirai, that is an excellent point. And the microbiome um, does play a role in that because depending on that balance, that delicate balance between those two organisms that I talked about earlier, it can open up some of those tight junctions and allow certain solutes in and out. A lot of people don't understand that, you know, the gut, the GI tract, that's, that inner lining performs a tremendous amount of functions and it's dealt with based on channels. And these channels, are kind of like these little pathways and they open and close based on certain signals. So when these junctions between cells start to separate some, or when these channels open at the wrong times, that's where that leaky gut and inflammatory state comes from. If the body is dysregulated, if you have that dysbiosis that I mentioned earlier, where the microbiome is off, it does predispose to some of those leaky gut activities. So 
anti-inflammatory types of diets are really very helpful. Things that decrease the inflammation that we see globally can help with things like obesity and a number of other medical conditions. So let me go back to something that Dr. Cutter said early on with one of her slides. And that was a slide where you had, I think, was it the Neotander Old Man? Yes. <laughs> now, if you go back, and some of the statements I make may be controversial, and I admit that at this point straight off. Uh, but uh, we know that humans are hardwired to certain things in their diet that they are attracted to. If something is sweet, if something is crunchy, if something is salty. And this means that uh, there's a pathway, there are 14 pathways to the brain of food called glute pathways, one through 14. And how the food is coated, all calories are not equal. One calorie of an apple is not the same as a calorie in a piece of spaghetti. And based upon that code that each one of those types of substances has, they may go through a different pathway to the brain. It has been shown in FDA research that if you put a substance on your tongue, if it chooses that GLUT1 pathway, it may have between one and 10 seconds to get to the hypothalamus because it may or may not get to the what we call the blood brain barrier as fast as it should have. And we're going to have, we had a speaker one night on our doctor's call that I'm going to have one Sunday and talk about these pathways of how we can create foods that we can actually code the substance so you can eat a bowl of ice cream and have no more caloric effect than you would from an apple. And that to me is interesting because it goes back to what Dr. Cutter was saying about how we were wired different. We're not wired different, but we're wired from way back when before we started having processed foods. So it's important what you put in your mouth and when you put it in your mouth and what pathway your body is set up to make those either become fattening or non-fattening based on how it gets to the blood-brain barrier. Are there any other questions or comments? Doctor, non-doctor, anybody would like to add to this conversation? Dr. Gibson, are you on? He's muted. Okay. Um, I'm trying to get some other people in on this discussion. Ms. Blackshear, Dr. Goffney. Dr. Goffney is also a cancer surgeon in Long Beach. Ms. Mentors. Uh, Dr. Gibson is muted, he said. Uh, he needs to be unmuted. And I'd love for you to unmute Lois Blackshear. She is an example to us all. She is in her 90s, healthy, fit, walking, full of energy, lean, all of those things, and Let's has get, just tremendous philosophies. Let's get Ms. Blackshear unmuted. Ms. Blackshear, welcome to the program. And also Dr. Goffney just said that he's he's muted too. He needs to be unmuted. So is Goffney... Um, I'm, is Simon here? Okay, Black. Lois Blackshear is unmuted. Okay. Hi, Aunt Lois. Hello, doctor. Hello, doctor. Hello, Suzanne. Let me tell you, your address was dynamic. There was one thing, though, I'm curious about. It's when Dr. Massey was just mentioning it. it was, you don't hear any more about the hypothalamus. And I was glad to hear that term mentioned. I used to hear it when I was a child, but I haven't heard that term for 20 years or more. And I wanted him to uh, emphasize a little more on the hypothalamus. Well, thank you. I have to ask you a question. How young did you say you were? I'm only 93. Only 93. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> God bless you. Can I, give, can I give you just a quick overview of this woman, how incredible she is? She is one of the original kind of hidden figures types, uh, working uh, in programming in D.C. with the high you know, security clearance and all that way back when, when, you know, nobody knew about these people. And then she went on uh, to become a breast cancer survivor and 
uh, utilize uh, macrobiotic diet and some other things to really kind of keep herself disease free. And during COVID, she got COVID and it impacted her so little that she was taking care of other people <laughs> while she had COVID and uh, broke some bones. She recovered quickly. I mean, she's just really a marvel. So I just have to emphasize my, my dear Aunt Lois uh, and I'm so glad she joined us today. So please go on with uh, answering well, the thank question. You. I'm gonna come by your house and get some of your jeans. <laughs> the superhero. Yeah. Thank really you. Good. Good. So the hypothalamus is known as the appetite center. And as I mentioned before, it has been recently uncovered in the past 10 years that part of the way that it works is through something called the endocannabinoid system, meaning that we make a hormone that's similar to uh, cannabis. And the cannabis, you know, for those of us uh, who've seen people have it, I haven't had it myself, of course, but it can make you have the munchies. It makes you eat more. Uh, so that is part of the control process of the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus controls your appetite. It also controls your metabolism in certain areas. And maybe we'll do a program in the next month or two on everything the hypothalamus does. Uh, so it is a very important uh, part of our body. And there's part of that called the ventral medial nucleus that is really involved in whether you uh, sate it from eating a certain meal or not. But I'd love to meet you. Maybe Dr. Cutter will bring me by one day. Are you in the East Coast or West Coast? She she used to be out here. She's actually now on the East Coast. But uh, one time when she was visiting, I took her to some of my business meetings. They said, oh, who's this nice little old lady? She started asking like you know economics questions and finance questions. They said, who is this individual? Where did you find her? She's really amazing. So I hope you do get a chance to meet her. Okay, very, very much so. Uh, did we unmute Dr. Gibson? While we're unmuting him, Dr. Maxi, there's a question about the consumption of water and when you should uh, consume water. And uh, maybe Dr. Cutter, I have my answer for that, but I also would like to hear Dr. Cutter's answer on that. She mentioned that you need to drink one half your body weight in water every day or your weight in kilograms so uh, had, had in ounces funny, of water. I had a funny comment on that, Dr. Sherrod. If some people drink half their weight in water, they probably drown. But go ahead, Dr. Cutter. <laughs> <laughs> weight in well, kilograms that's... transferred as in ounces. So you know, it's, I think it's good to start the morning with some room temperature water. I try to have 20, 20 to 25 ounces first thing in the morning, room temperature, full stop. So, you know, you can fill up a water bottle like this, wake up in the morning, just drink it down, just drink it. And then, you know, be strategic about the times of the day because a lot of people don't like to drink water because it makes them go to the bathroom. So you want to do it at a time where you can drink it, do what you have to do to eliminate and move on. So that would be my recommendation. And then be careful about when you have it at, toward the end of the day, because you don't want it to wake you up from sleep. So I would say stopping about three hours prior to going to bed is about the optimal time. So if you go to bed at nine o'clock, and by the way, if I went to bed at nine, I would be up at two. If you go to bed at nine o'clock, you want to stop drinking at six. Likewise, if you go to bed at midnight, stop drinking around nine. And then, you know, that way it won't, you won't have noctiuria or other words, urination overnight. What's your answer, Dr. Sherrod? My answer, and this is from my hydrotherapist. She said, when you get up in the morning, the first thing you do is drink two glasses of water. That's like 16 ounces. And then do two more in midday and then two more at three o'clock and then two later on, like around six, if you don't want to worry about having to get up at night to urinate. So you can actually just in stages, you could do two, two when you first get up, two at 10, two at 12 noon, two before dinner, and then just two more later, you know, before you go to bed. And that pretty much breaks it up and make it easier and doesn't seem like it's a big load and burden. I've been doing that and, you know, it seems to work for me. It's fantastic. So that's a yeah. good suggestion, too, from a practical standpoint, if you're not into the water bottles. Let me ask another question. Is Mr. Cooper Simon, you've had martial arts training. Did they tell you anything about drinking water? Um, not specifically, just more so that if you're going to be 
living an active lifestyle, working out, um, any type of exercise where you work up a sweat, you know, try to replace that fluid that you lose through sweat by drinking some water. Okay. Keep yourself and remind, hydrated. And, and I remind people that just by breathing alone, you lose, I'm told, about a liter and a half of water a day just by breathing. Right. The insensible loss. And can I just piggyback on that comment? You know, when you're working out and sweating, you know, that's some of the research that brought Gatorade into being that, you know, a lot of athletic teams before Gatorade was around, they would drink water, but they still just could not keep up with the loss. So you do want to try to get some some electrolytes into your beverages. Of course, with some beverages, sugar comes with that. So you want to get some kind of sugar less electrolytes into your beverages. And there's ways to do that. There's also a question about consuming water while eating. And um, my recommendations on that is that you have to be very careful about that because you can dilute your digestive enzymes if you consume water while you're eating. You should drink the water after eating, 30 minutes after eating, as opposed to having it with your meal. Okay, that's a very interesting point. Dr. Maximea. Dr. Gibson. Oh, Dr. Gibson is on now. Yes, I, I, uh, to, I would love to, to basically uh, mine some, some clinical pearls that we could take away from today. Um, uh, Dr. Neighbor Stevens would often say, well, I'll give you, well, she, she didn't say that, but another friend of mine would say, I'll give you five seconds of ain't it awful, but you got to give me 20 minutes of what we're going to do about it. Well, here's something that we can do, and it's not hard at all especially when you look at the size of the zucchinis you get in a grocery store for your money, make a family garden. This can serve as an excellent STEM teaching experience for the young'uns, some exercise for the not so young'uns. And in, in addition to that, the, the whole thing about the water, starting the day with the with water helps you <clears throat> with that science lesson because our body is made out of mostly what? Hello, water. water. So if we not only drink that water, but at room temperature to the doctor's credit, because the body's used to that temperature, not shock and all, but just basic room temperature water. Wonderful. Take that and kick it up a notch with foods that are the colors of the rainbow. Why? Because the higher, the deeper, the richer the color of the food, the higher the antioxidant content. That's um about all I got time for. Catch you next time. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, is Doctor Goffney able to unmute? He usually cannot, but if he can, I'd like to hear a comment from him. Thank you very much, Dr. Maxi. I am unmuted now. I was prohibited <laughs> before. Excellent talks uh, from both you and Dr. Cutter. I appreciate that. Um, you know, regarding the water issue, I don't prescribe any certain amount for my patients to drink. I usually tell them if they're, if they're thirsty, then choose water instead of choosing a soda or a pop, as uh, Dr. And Dr. Cutter put it. I think your body will pretty much regulate how much water you need to take in. Uh, another thing um, from a practical standpoint, in my clinic, I see a lot of women who have breast cancer or other type of uh, breast lesion. And a lot of them are, are overweight. Um, and so I don't miss the opportunity to tell them that they need to build muscle. I think that's true for most women. Dr. Cutter touched upon it. If you add a little bit of weight training to whatever exercise program you might want to do, it's so much easier to lose the weight or maintain your weight at a reasonable level uh, if you have more muscle. So uh, I really prescribe that. There are some women who don't want to go to a gym. And I, I asked them if they have any stairs at home. If they do, I'll put them on a regimen where they walk up and down the stairs, maybe 20 times in an hour, where each up and down cycle really represents one. And if I can get them to do 20 to 25 cycles in an hour, they build a lot of muscle on the thighs and in the buttock area. Those are some of the biggest muscles in the body. And if you do that routinely, you could lose a lot of weight just with that exercise and not going to the gym. So. I like that comment. And what building muscle does, as, as I mentioned in my brief talk, 
brown fat is made from muscle. And you increase your brown fat when you do that. White fat is made from connective tissue. So that's a very good connection. And connective tissue doesn't burn the same amount of energy or it's not doesn't create the amount of heat uh, as does uh, brown fat. So that's very important to build that red muscle. And that's important. I have a, a question, a humorous question for those of us who just came back from New Orleans and a person on the call, Mr. Dorsey, who happened to be from Baton Rouge. Is there any advantage or disadvantage of, of eating gumbo? We got about five minutes to answer that question before we at the top of the hour. Well, there's clear advantages. It's delicious. <laughs> You've got some seafood in there, some chicken. The sausage is not so good for you, but hey, we love andouille. I actually had some that had alligator sausage in it. That was delicious. And these beads are actually from New Orleans. It was one of the decorations for one of the receptions there. So I thought I would wear this in honor of the NMA convention. Dr. Williams? Well, I'll simply say that I don't think you have to have an advantage uh, indication to eat gumbo. And we had plenty of great gumbo at my reception and uh, jazz gig at Sweet Lorraine's. And uh, I don't think anybody claimed a particular dietary advantage from eating it, but they certainly did enjoy it. Dr. Sherrod from Mississippi. Gumbo is good for you. Yes. <laughs> it has a lot of protein. <laughs> Lots of protein. I love it. Um, and lastly, Mr. Darcy, are you unmuted? <laughs> well, I'll just give Mr. Darcy's comment. What goes in the gumbo? He said, whatever he can catch and can't get away <laughs> goes in the gumbo. <laughs> Dr. Cutter, I really want to thank you for your astute talk today. I learned a lot. I'm sure our audience did too. And we, I'm going to continue this saga periodically of dealing with the issues of metabolism and obesity in the future. I think there's a lot to be unpacked there that we didn't have time to get to. And I appreciate Dr. Williams and Dr. Sherrod for assisting me as the moderating this uh, event. Thank you, Simon, for putting things together. Have a happy Sunday, everybody. Dr. Maxey, before you go, yes. can I make one brief comment that I think would be of practical significance? Yeah. Two days from now, I'm going to be having a conversation with the chief, uh, I guess you might say, money person at Novo Nordisk, which is the uh, company that makes o Ozempic, as you know. Yes. Um, one of the reasons for that conversation is to discuss the possibility of doing something from a cons consortium standpoint to benefit Black organizations and institutions in focusing on obesity and overweight uh, in African Americans. And I sent out, I guess about three or four weeks ago, a letter uh, to different organizations and individuals telling them that I was going to be doing this. So that's coming up. And I want to make sure that everybody recognizes the fact that we need to be together in approaching this problem. And I'm going to try to make sure that any funds that I can have accumulated will be distributed to organizations and institutions that can make good use of it for our benefit. Well, thank you. So thank much. you. Yeah, I answered that letter, Dr. Uh, Dr. Williams. I, uh, that's a great idea. I th hopefully we can get money for a curriculum for high school students yes. right. on, and, and, on eating I, habits. Yeah. Yes. And I answered on behalf of the Charles R. Drew Medical Society. We do have yeah. a health and wellness curriculum for medical students and residents. So we would love to be able to further that. And the Black okay. Health Trust has a letter that has been composed. I just need to push the button and send it to you. So we want to be a part of whatever you're doing. Uh, one you. last thing. Next week, we're going to have a talk from a Dr. Hines, uh, who's going to talk about uh, uh, Fibroid. Fibroid. For fibroid tumors. And uh, that'll be a very interesting topic next week, same time. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank She's you. from ABWP, Association of Black Women Physicians. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>